Well, my story begins uh, some years ago when I was a young boy growing up on our family farm in the south of England. At that time, I think I felt everybody had lots to eat. I was secure in that thought, and I'm not entirely clear in my own mind how I became aware that that wasn't the case. But of course, today, hopefully, all of you are all too well aware that uh, things are not that rosy, that there are uh, nearly a billion people in the world who will go to bed tonight hungry. And the thrust of what I want to say today is really to try to make us, get us all to think about what sort of contribution we can make to addressing that challenge. I have a strong feeling that those of us who do have effectively enough to eat, and I'm well aware that that's not true of people even in this community, of all people in this community, but those of us that are fortunate enough to be able to access sufficient food have some responsibility to try to grapple with this thorny issue. Why is it that so many people really in most parts of the world do not have access to an adequate supply of healthy, nutritious food to allow them an active, healthy lifestyle? Now that's a, a definition of food security, which is a term I guess that I will use as we go through. Now I'm a crop scientist, I've developed my interest in plants and crops and food working on the farm and I've been very fortunate to be paid to pursue my hobby for more years than I care to mention. We do this here in Lancaster and I feel very fortunate to be part of a community which pursues this aim of trying to make more food available to more people. I think our approach is unusual in that it's an interdisciplinary approach, we work across the definitions of disciplines here. We're clearly aware that we can't resolve the problem of hunger, the hunger problem around the world, simply by producing more food. There are lots of other considerations and we'll touch upon those. And we're fortunate in having a community here uh, to address that suite of issues and to be able to do it collaboratively. And this is a central theme of what I want to try uh, to put across to you in the next, next few minutes. So let's look at some challenges. I've chosen three sets of issues which I'm going to focus upon. This is a pretty grand, it is a grand challenge. We recognize this as a global community. And I want to focus on the magnitude of that challenge and we shouldn't try to underestimate that. But at the same time, I want to be optimistic because I believe that the global community has the vision, the expertise, the commitment to do something about this. We're very good at defining the magnitude of the problem. And I have to say that really as a group of practitioners in this area, we do, in my view, spend too much time squabbling over just what we're going to do about it. And what I'd like to do today is establish that we can achieve quite a lot by making some sort of interdisciplinary commitment. So by this time, I guess you've, you've read this, this is a serious problem. Billion people without enough to eat, probably two billion others who are nutritionally inadequately served. And we all understand, particularly with young people, what the problems that can be caused by not having enough to eat and, and also, of course, by not having nutritious food to eat. And this is, as I say, a grand challenge and something that I, I believe we, we would all accept we need to address. Now, I've already told you I'm a crop scientist and, and I believe strongly that crop science has a role to play here, that by producing more food, we can make a contribution. I've already said I don't think we can solve this problem if indeed there is a solution, but we can make a contribution. Now, one of the, one of the criticisms of that as an idea, which we've, we come across commonly, is that technology won't solve these problems. Hunger is more complicated than that. And I think that's right, 
But as I say, I think there's a contribution that can be made. Another criticism is that we can throw money at producing new seeds, improved plants, which will undoubtedly impact, but it's not entirely clear where that impact will be, who will benefit from that. But I think there are much, much more positive aspects of that. That kind of science, crop, crop improvement, is going on in international research centers around the world where the science is for the public good. So centers in Mexico, Philippines, and until comparatively recently, a big effort in Syria. So that, that science is there and it's available to even the most needy of smallholder farmers. Many scientists, and we're privileged enough to be part of that community, work with farmers in some of the most challenging parts of the world in a process called participatory plant breeding, specifically to try to ensure that the people who need this improved genetic material can get hold of it and that they shouldn't be prohibited from benefiting from all of this knowledge simply by not being able to afford to access the seeds. So I think there are positive ways ahead on this particular issue. But we've already said that food production alone will not solve this problem. Here's an example of another set of issues which are really to do with, or mu much of, much of a, a potential solution to this set of issues is, is a change in behavior. Working with people who have uh, the privilege of being able to choose what sort of food they eat to ensure that the right food choices are made, linking nutrition and health. And these are big components of, of food security. One and a half billion people probably also eat too much food. And this is clearly an issue um, that, that needs to be addressed. So there are lots of behavioral issues here. There are issues of knowledge transfer. How, how do we address these? Well, there are lots of disciplines involved, lots of social science, lots of behavioral science, trying to raise the profile of these issues. And I'm sure that there's a case for doing more within schools to particularly sensitize young people to some, some of these challenges so that more people see this as a worthy set of career opportunities. And so I think the, the, the whole set of educational opportunities, train, training opportunities, not as transfer opportunities are important. More pragmatically, maybe, a lot of people who work in this area feel that the case for local food is a, an interesting idea for all sorts of reasons. I mean, there are lots of environmental reasons, which we'll come to in a second, but a general feeling that the closer people are to the production of food, the more we understand what's involved in producing food. We've, we've been working on making a, an open course on, on food security, and I've talked to a wide range of food producers and practitioners, and I have learned an enormous amount about where our food comes from and how farmers work to increase availability, quality, the reliability of supply. And local food is an interesting issue. And we have some very, very good examples here in Lancaster of community gardening. Efforts that are encouraged by the Lancaster Sustainable Food Cities Group. But even closer to mainstream farming, we have a superb example of a local food hub operated north of Kendall by an, a really impressive farmer, John Geldart, who may be known to many of you, he runs the Plumgas Food Shop. His, his farm shop, his focus, his, his mind was concentrated in this area when the Kendall Bypass was built on the family farm. They now farm on the shore north of the bay. Their own food that they produce on the farm is fed into the farm shop. But he acts as a hub for l other local businesses. And as well as that retail outlet, they feed this food into 18 regional as the stores, where it's marketed as local food. There are lots of models, 
but I think this, this is an impressive one. There's not really any reason why yogurt should be quite so well traveled as, as it is. So there's a set of educational and behavioral issues, clearly opportunities for lots of disciplines other than the scientists that I highlighted when I was talking about issue uh, one. This is a diagram of the so-called food system and it really just summarizes the range of expertise that, that we need, as well as production, people who are concerned with distribution, who are concerned with food safety and nutrition, as I've said, people who are concerned about the costs of food, which is a really, really important issue. We're aware that as climate changes, it becomes more difficult to produce food. In 2008, we had a massive price spike cost of food skyrocketed, probably largely to do with adverse weather conditions. People who spend more than 50% of their income on food were pushed then in easily into poverty. For those of us that spend around 10% or less, clearly less of a problem, but we've already said there are plenty of people in this community who would see those price changes as a problem. And we need to grapple with that suite of issues if we're to grapple with it seriously as a problem. I'm going to say a little bit about the environment, both the effect of the environment on the, our ability to produce food, but also the effect of producing food on the environment. There are lots of hidden costs here that we need to grapple with. And of course, lots of issues here which are to do with social economic things that actually many of which have very little to do directly with food. And this is the reason that simply by producing more, we won't solve this, if indeed anything will. My third issue is focused on the environment. And I, I come back to this because if, if we decide that, well, actually production can help, we then need to ask ourselves whether the planet can really cope we're all aware, lots of publicity about the impact of changes in land use, farming, on biodiversity, lots of other imp impacts that we're aware of, adverse effects of farming, use of very large amounts of energy, impacts on release of greenhouse gases, etc. We just can't go on producing food at all costs. We need to hand a planet on to our children and our children's children. And so these are important issues. Our chief scientist of a few years ago, Sir John Beddington, coined the term the perfect storm to try to focus attention on this set of issues, this, this combination of issues which should concern us. Large numbers of extra people, many of whom, as their economies of their nations grow, want to eat more. Climate change making the production of food much, much more difficult in many parts of the world. And a shortage of resources like energy, water, fertilizer. Many farmers, smallholder farmers in the world, about, about 1.5 billion people are smallholder farmers, can't afford water, don't have access to fertilizer and water. And this situation is going to get worse as the climate changes. So the, for these and other reasons, this is why we need to try as a global community to address this kind of thing. And I just want to spend a minute on a piece of work that we've been fortunate enough to be involved in. This is in Northwest China. It's one of the driest parts of that country. This is a classic case of desertification. Tens of years ago, this was a wetland. Now, I'm not saying this is how the Loon Valley will look in the next 50 years, but this is frightening. This is a valley that's fed by an inland river system from the mountains, snow melt, runs to the desert. But well before it gets there, the farmers use it all. And the result of the fact that they're using too much water in the region in agriculture combined to reduce snow melt due to climate change means they're pumping groundwater. Groundwater levels have dropped tens or hundreds of meters in some areas. The farmers can no longer pump, and so the ve natural vegetation is dying. There's no control over erosion, sandstorms, 
creeping desertification, really frightening set of circumstances. This is a model that will be repeated increasingly around the world, making people's lives in this region almost impossible. So this is what happens. Villages are abandoned, people's health and well-being, very, very direct effects. And we're fortunate in Lancaster to be involved, collaborating with group in China Agricultural University to try to use less water in agriculture to try to cope with this situation, restore the natural vegetation, try to raise levels of groundwater to allow fa some farming to continue to allow these, these communities to continue. I think a good example of how science and social science interact potentially, hopefully, to change people's lives for the better. Now, there are lots of other problems and the sort of techniques that we use are water-saving agriculture, which I'd be delighted to discuss with people if we have time. I just want to say a little bit about fertiliser. I mean, this is a, an example of how agriculture can damage the environment. You can see here the algae in this water making the water un undrinkable. We need to do something about this to reduce the use of fertiliser for this and for other regions. But of course, in many parts of the world, farmers have no access to fertiliser and sub-Saharan Africa is a particularly serious problem. And we need to think about alternative ways of providing fertiliser which plants need, particularly nutrients which they need to yield and produce food. So just a few words in conclusion. I think there's a challenge here. I'd be interested in your reactions to that. And if you would like, should like to continue that conversation, as I said earlier, we have got a, an online course running. It starts next week on the FutureLearn platform and it would be good to engage with you there or, or indeed uh, in other fora locally. As I say, I think this is an optimistic story. We have the imagination, we have the expertise, we have the vision to do something about this at a whole variety of levels, using a whole variety of disciplines at our disposal. The question is, do we have the commitment? Thank you.